that's sort of equalizer. We've had three East Coast talks this morning. I'm going to try and fit a talk about three West Coast projects into one talk. So there we go. Right, so um, why are we uh, tracking salmon um, smolts in Scotland here? Uh, generally, one of the core aims that the, the Scottish government has is to sustainably grow the uh, salmon aquaculture section. Um, but it's also recognized that salmon farms increase the number of sea lice in the environment. Um, this is just a, an abbreviation of the topic sheet that you can find on the web page linked. But really, in terms of the projects, what we're uh, looking at is this core uh, part of the, the program to examine the outward migration of the salmon smokes using acoustic uh, tracking in key coastal areas and uh, model of movement patterns um, based on swimming behavior in relation to the tides and currents. So I'm going to touch upon some of the uh, preliminary, uh, preliminary stuff that we've done so far with this. I mean, we've only started doing the acoustic tracking last year, so this is very much uh, early work. So there's three separate projects involved. We've got the uh, smoke tracking of um, uh, fish up in Apple Cross. We've got the inner uh, linny um, salmon and sea trout smoke tracking, and then uh, smoke movements in, around the Isle of Mull. So the Apple Cross study was uh, primarily conducted by the team up at Shieldig, um, which is uh, led by Jason Godfrey. And uh, we're going to use uh, the, uh, an acoustic array uh, consisting of four coastal curtains uh, to aim uh, the aim of projects to look at the initial migration and uh, coastal movements of uh, salmon smokes using the Apple Cross River. So here's Apple Cross here, it's up in uh, the northwest of Scotland, um, just opposite uh, Sky and Rassie. So the array was constructed like this, it's uh, 20 receivers, um, two in the sea pool, just at the mouth of the river, um, nine spread across the bay, and we have uh, three smaller curtains spread along the coastline, one um, uh, down the coastline and two to the north on the coastline. Yeah, so we had uh, two release sites. Um, because the Applecross River, uh, river is quite a small river, uh, to maximize our possibility of catching smolts, we deployed a rotary screw trap and a flight connect at uh, the two white stars. Um, and that's basically the, uh, the names of the arrays, just for a future reference. Um, so 18 out of 20 of the smolts were uh, detected in the sea pool. Um, and only 11 of those were detected leaving the uh, bay on Curtain C. And subsequently, uh, four fish were detected on Curtain B, just up the coast. And only one was detected up on uh, Curtain A, up to the north coast. Uh, we did actually have uh, 19 out of the uh, 20 fish detected on Curtain C, but one of them was deemed to be, actually be a bird, so it seemed to bypass the sea pool completely. So. Um, this is uh, generally the, the speeds of the smokes as they're moving out um, into, the, uh, into the sea. With very s uh, slow speeds in the river and uh, higher movement rates once they get into the coastal area, but still um, very variable once they're out in the coast. Most of the smokes took a day to travel the 0.3 to 1.3 kilometers uh, from the tagging sites to the sea pool, which suggests some form of uh, handling and tagging induced delay. And uh, some smokes actually spent one to two days in the sea pool before departing. Um, and uh, movements from the sea pool into the bay were predominantly at night. And as I've said, the speeds in the bay and the coast were highly variable. We actually uh, conducted some range testing with a boat to have a look at the uh, the um, um, efficacy of the, the array. And uh, we've actually found that on three separate um, range testing dates, the uh, detection ranges of the uh, receivers were significantly um, well, heavily altered by the, the wind force um, when you're out at sea doing the tracking. So it suggests that if you do one single range test during your, your study, that uh, it may give you a uh, false impression of how efficient your receivers are. Similarly, we deployed some uh, Sentinel tags um, on Curtin A, and um, these were slightly skewed, so they were newer one set of receivers than the other. And uh, 
what's very apparent is that the efficiency of the receivers are very temporary patchy. You could have very high efficiencies, which then seemingly drop straight off a cliff, and you're, you're getting almost 0% efficiency in some of, these, uh, some of these receivers. And this seems to um, be affected by, by range. So the further obvious, the obvious uh, relationship, the further away you are from a receiver, the less efficient um, the receiver is. We also uh, had an, another set of Sentinel tags on our AC, which were uh, put in at one meter depth and four meter depth rather than just four meter uh, depth, like it was in um, Array A. And again, the same pattern is very apparent. There's, there's no real uh, periods where you're not getting spikes in detection efficiency. We've also just recently started to uh, do some particle tracking with uh, um, the, date, well, the Scottish Shelf model, which is a, a, sort of a new tool we're, we've developed where we can start having a look at um, hydrological models in the sea. Um, this work was uh, done by one of a, a postdoc that's just joined our group, who, um, uh, James Ownsley, who's uh, more on the mathematical modeling side of things. So it's a simulation of 5,000 passive particles released uh, in Applecross Bay throughout the typical smoke period. Um, these are constrained to uh, the typical um, water column depths that a smoke would swim in. And the counts are based on hourly observations of individual particle locations. So you can see that there's, a, there's quite a, a strong sort of grouping of uh, particles on the northern half of the, the uh, bay, which ties in with what we've seen from the smoke. And also the particles then are predominantly drawn northward. But when you have a look at this in a uh, national uh, context, these passive particles will continue to just circulate around the coast of uh, Scotland. So it starts to pose some questions about um, what smokes actually do to avoid just ending up down in England, you know, instead of Norway. So. So just to summarize Applecross, uh, detections leaving Applecross were predominantly upper half of C. There's high variation in speeds. Um, and sub subsequent detections in curtains A, a and B were low. Um, if you have a look at the, the actual particle tracks, you can see that the currents will probably take smokes further away from the coastline than the curtain actually inhabits. So uh, rather than a mass dive of smokes, I think it's just the, the receiver array was small and missed lots of smokes. <coughs> The thing about the Sentinel tag data is these Sentinel tags were repeating every 10 minutes. So um, they might be uh, quite conservative in, in their uh, efficiency estimates, whereas a, a tag, an ID tag repeats roughly every sort of 30 seconds. So you've got a, a much uh, higher chance of detecting an ID tag when it moves through a receiver's detection field than a, a Sentinel tag that goes off every 10 minutes. So I guess the, the take home from the particle tracking is we need to do further modeling of the biological data and um, uh, in regard to currents and see what the smokes are actually doing. Um, so this work is um, work in Interlock Linney. This is actually work done by Stuart Middlemas. I'm just presenting it. So if you can avoid tricky questions, that would be great at the end. Um, and to add a bit more controversy, this is uh, the first comparative information of sea trout post smokes in Scotland. So it somewhat counters Angus's earlier suggestion. Um, really, it's to examine how much time uh, sea trout and salmon spend in inshore areas during the initial period of residence in the sea. Very few studies have actually, have actually done this. It's actually a lot of information from Norway, but there's little to no information in Scotland um, and the information is very very important for uh, the inshore environment and uh, potential marine planning issues. So this is a sort of general map of the study. The uh, smokes were, were captured in, and uh, released on the uh, Lundy Burn in the River Nevis and uh, there's uh, I think the black circles are 
are um, individual receivers, and the triangles, I think, are well, the, the diamonds are uh, arrays of receivers. So it's 15 salmon and 20 sea trout from the uh, Lundy and 35 salmon from the Nevis. And there was uh, no difference between salmon and sea trout when they entered the sea. And they entered on a, an ebbing tide, uh, prim uh, primarily. But you can see they, they tended to enter, uh, enter the uh, salt water on, on more or less all of the uh, tidal states, but they were predominantly during a, an ebb tide. Uh, same with time of day, it, they tended to enter in at most, uh, well, any hour of the day, but it was heavily weighted towards uh, night time. So we've got uh, information uh, provided by the, uh, the receiver groups, um, and it's grouped into hourly se segments and uh, the proportion of detected hours in each receiver group for the first seven days. Sorry, the, um, this was then put into a hierar uh, hierarchical cluster analysis to work out if there was uh, patterns of spatial use <coughs> among tagged uh, sea trout and salmon. So these are the clusters here. You see that there's uh, two real clusters one predominated by uh, salmon and one by trout. And when you actually have a look at uh, where these uh, fish ended up, most of the salmon decided to just then um, try and quickly leave uh, the upper lock of, uh, linear out through uh, Cora Narrows, whereas the sea trout tended to hang around the mouth of the lochie and then move into the lochie um, So there's, there doesn't seem to be any real um, effort to, to leave the loch. But it's not 100% differentiation, there's, there is some overlap. So yeah, um, just a brief uh, summary. Uh, no differences in when they leave the river. And once in the sea, the majority of trout stay in the local area. And this basically highlights that uh, offshore um, planning um, can have a, a much higher impact on sea trout than salmon. And the third and final study is uh, tracking smokes as they pass the Isle of Mull. So this is really to look at the uh, migration routes that salmon smokes take uh, from two different stocks. So here we have the Isle of Mull here and uh, the, um, the mouth of uh, Loch Linney. So we've got uh, an array that um, attempts to uh, track fish at least once as they leave this, uh, this arena. I think there's um, <coughs> 34 receivers in total, and the array was uh, deployed with, in collaboration with SNH for their uh, skate and spur dog tracking. So there's uh, some elements of the array are, are specifically for tracking skate and spur dog, like the uh, individual receivers, which are the black dots, are put there uh, specifically in deep areas of water to, with, with a view to actually detect uh, skate and spur dog more than smolts. So we have our two stocks of fish. They enter into the sea roughly around the same area. Hopefully a bit more lively than that. <laughs> but anyway, um, so the route choice, they can go up the Sound of Mull or down the Firth of Lorne. Um, and what is uh, influencing that. So here we've got a map of the, uh, the receiver array. Let's try and work out which one the laser is. Ah, there we go. You see this uh, array here, actually. Um, this isn't um, fish not getting detected. This is, this is actually damaged the array. You can also see patches here. Um, one of the unfortunate side effects of having an array in this area of the sea is that it's got quite a lot of boat traffic and when you've got surface, uh, surface floats holding your receivers up, um, if, if, a, if a big boat comes along and severs the, the buoy off then you lose your receiver. So thankfully this year we're actually redeploying some of these receivers on acoustic releases and having them subsurface so we can hopefully avoid getting our moorings chopped up again. But anyway, the Data seems to suggest that um, the fish that predominantly go up the um, Sound of Mull are from the, the Lockie, but also um, Lockie fish actually tend to go south as well. Um, there were a couple of um, fish from the River Awe that, 
that went up uh, northward, but uh, on the whole, they tended to go southward. So there seems to be a kind of split um, if you're a Lockheed fish, whereas it's a lot more cut and dry if you're, a, if you're an off fish, you go south. So here, this is just the same data recolored. So um, you can see that actually there's a bit of indecision among smolts that were here. Some that actually ended up going south went uh, up uh, the north route first and then before going south. And likewise, some that ended up going north went south first. So some behavioral patterns that we can't really answer at the moment, but they're of interest. Some actually ended up in the array, and we don't know whether or not the fish that ended up in the array are either predated or they left the array through some of the, some of the gaps that it formed. So this is just generally to show the, uh, the variation in speeds of fish moving within the array. It's very variable, um, as you'd expect. And again, this is uh, the same data, but put into the context of, of ebbing and flooding. Um, and it seems the fish moved the fastest when it was an ebbing, ebbing tide. However, th it seems that there's, this is, this is generally quite coarse. Um, I, you know, I don't think that's really telling us much. So, uh, using the same kind of um, modeling that we have for the particle tracking, we're trying to combine uh, the biological data we have with, uh, with this current, current data to see if we can actually get something much more informative out of it. So percentage-wise, it was 52.5% uh, and, and, and uh, of smolts. I don't know how half a smolt detect, gets detected, but anyway. Um, so this shows that uh, we've got reasonably good, as you classically term, survival of smolts that have been tagged approximately uh, 50 kilometers away in some cases. And the uh, movement rate was very variable. I mean, uh, you, you, you see something like 5.3 body lengths per second, and you've got to wonder if that's, uh, that's uh, dictated by um, current or if it's in something that has wings. You never know. Um, root choice seems very varied for the walkie. It's 46% of detected fish ended up uh, going south and uh, 38 went uh, north. <laughs> Contrasting that to the off fish, it seems to be much more uh, directed towards going down the Firth of Lorne. And the main question I have is, is this dictated by currents? Is it, is it to do with the tidal phase? And is the water going one way when you enter the sea at a certain time? And is it going the other way when you enter the sea at the, at the other time? So really, there's a, a need to uh, take this further and have a look at the current modeling. Because um, I, I don't think uh, acoustic telemetry alone is going to have all the answers. So I think a, a much more uh, mixed and integrated approach uh, could be used. This is um, actually just an animation for Apple Cross, and it just shows the kind of current, how the currents vary in the area um, by month. It's crude, but quite, uh, quite nice to show what the shelf model can produce. We actually have uh, current meters that have been deployed this, uh, this spring in, the, uh, in uh, the area around Mull. So the hope is that rather than just take the, the pure output from the shelf model, we can actually validate it by using um, actual recorded uh, current, um, current data. So um, there's a real hope that we can, we can sort of get quite a robust estimate of the, the currents in the area. So for general study, this is really the first uh, outputs for a 10-year program of work. These outputs are, are, are useful for future marine planning decisions. And so tying in the biological movements of smolts with the Scottish shelf model and particle tracking could, and a sort of caveat that could, uh, lead to uh, predictive modeling of smolt dispersal. So we, we could eventually end up with quite a, quite a nice tool to predict where smolts go. Um, but in the interim, I'd say that uh, acoustic telemetry still remains the best tool for characterizing uh, smoke movements. And that is it, I think.